Composition. Oh. I will be facilitating the class today. The class is on composition of cell phone photographs. Uh, New Knowledge Adventure is a volunteer program uh, of education for uh, ongoing education for seniors. It was started about 15 years ago in the Treasure Valley and, um, or in 2015, excuse me. It has gone on a lot longer in the Pocatello area, but we modeled ours after them. It is a collaboration with uh, AARP and uh, Idaho State University. This is fully a volunteer uh, run program so that all of the instructors and all of the field personnel and the leadership composition team are volunteers uh, that have a passion for ongoing learning and for educating others. As she said, all classes are recorded and you can watch all classes on um, Treasure Valley NKA, which stands for New Knowledge Adventures uh, on YouTube. There, the ground rules are that you can come and leave the class anytime that you want. Uh, that's no problem. The microphones will not be muted for this class because Chris wishes that uh, people who are able to ask their question, to interrupt him and ask their question as he's talking on a specific subject or showing a specific photograph uh, rather than going trying to go back to it. Professional language and behavior uh, needs to go on at all times. If there are any uh, problems with, uh, you know, ex extemporaneous uh, noises, we will mute, try to mute that person. Okay, Chris, it's all up to you. Good morning and welcome to my Zoom presentation. Uh, as said before, this is uh, about composition techniques for cell phone photographers. Um, beauty surrounds us every day. Photographers capture this beauty and, uh, and share it with the world. Composition is the tool that photographers use to share this beauty. I've got a couple of disclaimers. Um, I shoot with a DSL, DSLR, a digital single lens reflex camera. And when I was approached, uh, to teach this class, those are the images I have, those are the images that you'll see, but I'm going to use those to exemplify the techniques that you as a cell phone photographer can use to take pictures. Secondly, um, there are about uh, 11 pictures that I've gotten from the internet because I didn't have a picture that would exemplify um, that concept. The best camera you want to know which is the best camera, right? The best camera is the one you have with you. Uh, that camera is usually your cell phone. Actually, some cell phone cameras are equipped with multiple specialized lenses. Um, I've got a, a, a Samsung 21, uh, and it's got like five different lenses on the, on the back of the camera. So the following are the, tech, uh, the compositional techniques that we'll be discussing today. Compose in camera, choose what to photograph, camera position, fill the frame, draw the viewer's eye, photographing people, and tell the story. This presentation contains quite a few images to exemplify these composition techniques as you view these images, please note how they also tell stories. In many instances, using your cell phone, you're lucky to even get a quick photo. You don't have time to be artistic or to capture a considered well-composed image. I like this man's expression. <laughs> and that the bull is completely off the ground. You know, like a 2,000 pound bull. That's amazing. Given more time with a landscape or posed subjects, 
you have more time to employ some compositional techniques. Key tip is to compose in camera. Given time, you can compose your image on your cell phone screen. Your images will be stronger, more interesting, and require less post-processing. Composing in camera also <laughs> allows you to capture compelling images that catch your eye. You can include elements of interest and exclude distracting elements. As a result, you'll need fewer crops. Your cell phone camera has fewer pixels than a point and shoot, a mirrorless camera, or a DSLR camera. My Samsung Galaxy 21 Ultra has a great telephoto lens. I wanted a camera on which I could make phone calls. If you look off in the distance, well, with my, with my cell phone, I was able to zoom in this far. It's like a hundred times, it's, it's great. You notice in the corner there, the, the seal. Well, I was able to zoom in on him. And here's the more seal. The limited pixels become a problem once you start editing or your cell phone images. Should you crop them very much, they can become pixelated. While this looks like a nice painting, um, this is a copy of the distant image. Um, it's artsy, but the details are very blurred. So we want to avoid having to do any post-processing. Use as many of the pixels that you have. You should remember that your selfie camera has fewer pixels than your main camera. Oops, sorry. So your selfie images will be better if captured by another person using your main lenses. Your first decision is what to photograph. Over the years, you've all developed your own photographic style. You know what subjects draw your interest and your desire to share. The essence of photography is capturing images of interest to you. The composition pointers in this presentation should help you capture your, your interests in a more powerful and time-tested manner. Personally, I love reflections and shadows. I, I think they're magical fleeting products of light. Here's a fellow at the, uh, in Rome at the uh, Colosseum. And so I captured the Colosseum reflected in his Ray-Bans. I don't know if many of you have been to the SeaTac airport and seen the viewing window, um, but here's an interesting perspective on it. I got close to the glass, shot along the, the window, and so within the glass was a, was, were multiple reflections of the um, viewing window. Europe at a train station, um, the escalator and ceiling lights were reflected on a, on a wall, but there's lots of interesting lines going up and down and left and right. Here, the buildings are reflected on the gondola as it emerges from under a bridge. Her sunglasses are reflecting a red logo on, a, on her black t-shirt. Here, an umbrella is reflected in these sunglasses. In this sunglasses reflection, um, I had ridden a helicopter into the Grand Canyon. And so I've got the reflection of the Grand Canyon in her sunglasses. In the frame, you can see me taking the picture and at the bottom of her, of her uh, lens, you can see her and I standing in our shadows. Now here's an outfit on which to reflect. This Renaissance Fair combatant doesn't appear to have any dents, so he must be pretty good. Here the balloon pilot is giving a backlit double thumbs up to her crew. This, view, this is the view from inside her balloon 
shot from the basket opening. Your next decision is where to position your camera. Look at the phone screen and explore the scene. Look at your subject from various positions. Then you can decide which position presents the most compelling and interesting images. You can capture any and all of these versions of your interesting subject. It's your choice. In, in uh, December of 2017, I was asked to photograph the menorah lighting ceremony at the Capitol building. They had a four foot tall carved ice menorah and a carved ice dreidel. These ice carvings were interesting subjects. Uh, the next decision is where to position your camera, sorry. So here's the, here's the ice uh, menorah. However, when I got down low to include the rotunda poinsettias in my image, magic happened. Because of my perspective, I saw something that no one else saw. The flat surfaces at the top of the menorah reflected the red of the poinsettias, lighting the ice menorah. Changing your perspective can produce an entirely different image. In Cotor Montenegro, I saw this balcony and above it bedding drying on the line. However, a different perspective added new details and dimension to this image, adding to the story. You can see the shield of the people who live there and um, it's just another perspective. Here are four views of the same building. On a canal boat tour, I captured several images of an interesting building. I was struck by the, by the, different, by the difference perspective made for these four images of the same subject. I love the diagonal lines created by the shadows leading to the windows. Here at the, at the corner, uh, one set of windows is reflecting the opposite windows. This image combines both the diagonal shadows as well as the reflection of the, in the other windows. There are repeated patterns in the city block square Berlin monument to the, the Berlin memorial to the murdered Jews. Here you can note the boy jumping between the stones. Each new perspective yields a completely different image. Across from the Helsinki Airport Hotel is a winding staircase. You might have guessed its reflections caught my eye. I selected the lower right reflection of the stairs and their reflections. I love the double helix and the blue overlaid window frame grid. While I like seeing the harpist through her colored strings and the parallel shadows of the strings, of the uh, string tensioners, the second view adds harp details, her sleeves, uh, oops, uh, the harp also presents a strong diagonal line. A closer view reveals intricate colorful string tensioners. Note that the tensioners colors match the colors of the strings which they adjust. Am I leaving the pictures up long enough? Am I going too fast? No, I think it's perfect. Okay, great, thank you. Don't stop looking even when you think you found a cool perspective. There could be an even cooler image awaiting your discovery. <laughs> Many scenes have Easter eggs hidden in plain sight. Note the skull with the flower, the antelope, the fresco of license plates, the barbershop sign reflected in the mirror, as you can see by the sign, both of these images contain mirror reflections of the bearded man. By the way, <clears throat> you notice his red coat. 
An international photography competition reviewed all of their past winning entries. They discovered that all of their winners contained a red element. Decide how much of the scene to include, or more precisely, decide which element is your subject. A closer view repeat, reveals details. These options are stronger when captured in camera and not as crops. So obviously these are crops from my picture. No, actually these aren't. So these are, are uh, individual pictures that I took. Note the rivets, the sun reflection on the buckle and the strap shadow. Others will prefer a more inclusive image with less specific detail. The nice thing about digital is that you aren't limited to 12 or 36 images. You can take as many versions as you would like. Just for grins and giggles, note how her gauntlets hold their position on the perimeter fence. And I'm gonna try and This sequence of images investigates the details of her gun, the weapon handle. Note the reflection in her eyes. It's the light shaped by the visor slit. I love the detailed backlit shadow of this girl's dress, uh, dress lace and the backlit lace. It's surprising that many children don't know how to smile for a photo. They look terrified, and these are crops. While the koi fish are interesting, the reflection caught my eye. Is that cool? And so, ah, the eyes have it. You can choose which image or how close you want to be to your subject, which image to capture. I like the last as it shows his eye colors and smiling face. It tells the viewer what the subject is. So as a photographer, I feel it's my job to draw the viewer's eye to the element that I think is interesting, to draw their eye to the, tell them what the subject is. Your next decision is how to hold your camera. I'm referring to your phone orientation. Obviously you can hold your camera any way you wish. I generally consider the subject. Is your subject tall or wide? Hold your phone vertical for portrait, for a tree, a tall building, or a person. Hold your phone horizontal, landscape, if your subject is a forest, a city, a group of people, or a landscape. Portrait orientation. A portrait image is longest from the top to the bottom as in a classical portrait painting. So you can see that both of these are, are taller than they are wide. The young lady is posing for her parents near a Berlin Zoo fountain. And I was there and I took the picture. This girl on, the Helsinki, on a Helsinki bus tour made a, the grab bars her personal jungle gym. This young dance contestant in a Portland competition. I, I like her position, expression, and the implied movement. I like the detail in this gal's um, costume paint. Landscape. The landscaped image is longest from side to side. This man is managing the balloon movement <clears throat> with the top rope. Here are the Incredibles during the village villains at village shopping center. Fill your frame. To avoid distractions, fill your frame with the elements consistent with your subject. While this is a color image, the subject is black and white. It's a great one to challenge the younger generation um, one millennial noted, there's my name, Kim.
This is a bridge view in Amsterdam. They have lots and lots of bikes there. Um, and so most of the bridges have bikes parked on them. Unobserved beauty surrounds us. Even a simple arrangement can be beautiful. Here are two motorcycles. I like the red light uh, in the top left. Here's a beachfront walk-up eatery in one of the Cinque Terre. Now, I'll have several pictures of the Cinque Terre. In Italy, there are five very steep ravines, and the people who live there have built their farms and their homes on these steep ravines. Um, we'll have several pictures from that area. Hot air, hot air balloons are amazing. I love the light beam. So this is, we're talking about filling the frame, but in a variety of ways. These are dahlias in the Portland Saturday market and tomatoes in Italy. This is the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. Note the darker sections, the, the darker column sections. They have an interesting pattern in the material. This is a detailed close-up of the Las Vegas Eiffel Tower. This is one of the Cinque Terre. <clears throat> These tourists are standing by one of the many boats stored in the streets. This is back in Berlin, this decorated bear. You know how they, if you go to Seattle, everywhere you go, they've got these pigs that the people have decorated. If you go to Oklahoma City, they've got buffaloes. Well, in Berlin, the symbol is the bear. They have, they've got a lot of bears. There's a Picasso bear. We saw the Picasso bear at the post office. We saw one that was painted to look like it was all wrapped up to be mailed. Well, this is the bear in the US embassy in Berlin. Here's a fire eater. Here's a 13th century walled city in Nice, France. This rusty three wheeled delivery bike was captured in Coto Negro. While this looks like pumpkin scoopings, it's actually a Yellowstone bacterial mat in one of the hot pools. The bacteria in the geothermal pools are called thermophiles, heat lovers. Each color indicates the heat, the temperature in which that bacteria lives. Now I've got two things to say about this slide. Firstly, you'll notice the asterisk in the top left corner any pictures that are not from my camera will have an asterisk, just so you know it's from the internet. This is the Grand Prismatic Pool in Yellowstone National Park. Each bacteria color represents a different temperature. Um, for a size perspective, these are people on the boardwalk. These are crop patterns in the Palouse country. Here, this is also in a, a walled 13th century village in, uh, Mont in Couture, Montenegro. Here are the shutter hooks have cut through the plaster, revealing the bricks beneath. You can also see where the right side cherub used to be attached. I mean, here's a closer view. You can see here where the cherub used to be. Here are folks crossing a Venetian canal. This is my favorite image from Bologna. Um, I love the pop of the blue and yellow, um, which, which reminded me that uh, colors that are opposite on the color wheel uh, combine well and uh, really provide a pop. They tend to go together like blue and orange. Go figure. <laughs> Boise State colors. This is a windswept roadside snowbank near Haley, Idaho. The wind is howling across, etching and carving the crust. At the edge, it forms what are known as cornices. Their weight curves them down. And at the upper right, they created what looks like the Lion King. This is a close view of barnacles on the Oregon coast. 
This is the reflection of a ferry dock at Friday Harbor, Washington. The reflection was rearranged when a ferry boat came in to dock. And the second picture, I'm proud to say, hung at the Boise Art Museum for three months as part of the 2010 Triennial. Back to the, the Cinque Terre. They're known for their lemons. These lemons are the size of a grapefruit. I was amazed. Uh, this is in Barcelona. We flew into Barcelona before taking a cruise around Italy. The architectural, and so um, Gaudi, um, he made some really bizarre buildings, but they're really kind of cool. The, the architectural details of these windows are interesting. Then you add in the shadows and the reflections of the trees and neighboring buildings. To top this off, add in the people. Here's a lady at a dining table. Here's a man wearing uh, earphones and looking like he's going for going to be going for a job. Um, this is an Italian door knocker. Again, we're filling the frame with interesting details. Here's a dancing violinist in his jumping shadow seen at the exotic Boise Saturday Market. He was captured midair. On the whole, he is in focus, frozen in the air. However, his left foot was moving too fast for the shutter speed, so it's a little blurred. Please also note that the windows um, present the store interior, signage on the windows, and a reflection of the Saturday market. I love his expression. And then next to it are more musicians. These are musicians in Amsterdam dueling um, back and forth. So we're filling the frame, but you don't want to just fill it with anything. You want to eliminate distracting elements. In order to create a stronger image, adjust your camera position to exclude distracting elements. Exclude stray arms, legs, tree limbs, or people in the background. Um, so I adjusted this image using cropping. I'm suggesting that you use your cell phone position or angle, moving in closer or to, to eliminate uh, unwanted elements, distracting elements. Express your personal style. All of your images will, will reflect your personal style. Making adjustments in camera allows you to express that style without cropping later. Both of these images are, are valid choices. And there's nothing wrong with capturing both images. Close-ups can be interesting. You'll note that I included a reflection. And this is just a small element in a much larger complex wall decoration. The closer, okay, so here are two pictures. This is a, a band at a Renaissance fair. In the second picture, the closer view draws your attention to the people's faces, facial hair, and costume details. This view maintains the details of the instruments, the hand on the vested man, and the hand on the vested man's shoulder. And the second man from the left, you see the buttons on his sleeve. You see, but there's just a lot of interesting details within this image. In addition, by getting in closer, you eliminate distracting elements like the throne, the cross, and the, the tent, I believe it is. I love the details of this fairy group. Due to the far right fairy's wings, I had to include a few distracting background details. This closer image captures a view of the three young ladies and this delighted little fairy. You wanna draw your viewer's eye to the elements that you like, the important elements. Cropping in camera, positioning your camera. Allow, they allow you to focus on the portion of the scene and arrange it as you desire. It allows you to bring your viewer's eye to the element that you find most interesting. 
Some may find the shawl stripes and the arm wrapping of great interest. So by just shooting this into the image, you focus on the ear helmet you like. As I've noted, I love reflections. So my preference is the Torah and wrapped hands reflected on the glass. Doing this in camera saves you both time and precious pixels, which will be lost in post-processing. By the way, both men are grandfathers of the baby being circumcised at this bris. The rule of thirds, you've probably heard about this. This, are there any questions so far? It doesn't look like that. Okay. Um, the rule of thirds is a composition technique used by 18th century painters. By imagining a tic-tac-toe grid over your proposed image, you can determine the power points and power lines. These are locations within an image where the human eye tends to rest. In your camera settings, you can overlay the rule of thirds grid on your screen. On my camera, when I go into edit this, the rule of thirds grid pops up automatically. The idea is that the images are more powerful if the face, eye, or elements of interest um, are on an intersection. So you can see her hands, her nose, her face are on that power line, but they're also on that top power point. Further, the bodies and an upright element should be on one of the vertical lines. The fire and her face are on power points. Her head is on a power line. This is my nephew Bryson. His eye and the snail are both on power points. And crawling along the lower horizontal line. I love all the Easter eggs uh, the yummy details of this, G this Jack Sparrow costume. I love to see the connection. Note how the two people fill the frame. The horizon should be on one of the, the horizontal lines. Now, here's a, here are a few examples. Uh, you may want to snap a photo of this slide with your cell phone just for, uh, for, for later review. And you see the asterisk, this is also off the internet. So in the, in the top left one, you can see that the horizon is on the lower line and he's on a PowerPoint. The horizon in the uh, gray wall picture is on the, the horizon, excuse me, the top line is on the horizon. The, with the rock one, the third picture, the horizon is on the, the bottom line. The top of these mountains is on the top line. So they're, they're pretty well following in the, the surfer. I love this surfer picture. The uh, horizons on the top line. I especially like this one. Firstly, it is a shadow image. The horizon is on the top, power, <clears throat> the top power line. Excuse me, let me get a drink of water. Chris. Chris. Chris, uh, yeah. someone asked if uh, they can get a copy, if we can send out a copy of this slide. Uh, do you know if that's a possibility or where to get that on the internet? Um, I just looked up rule of thirds and it just popped up. All right. Um, so, so they'll be able they'll be able to go on the NKA YouTube site and, and pull this pre presentation up and they could take it then. Right. So the rule of thirds, you can see that the, the surfer is on the right horizontal line as is his shadow. And his surfboard and his shadow, the surfboard shadow are both on horizontal lines. 
Um, and then the PowerPoint is right in the in on his uh, on his person and on his shadow. Most photographers know the rule of thirds. However, many note that rules are made to be broken. So it's a nice thing to know about and it can help in some situations, but don't be locked into just using that. Use your eye. What's appealing to your eye is usually a good organization. They've got a number of grids that you can use. There's one that looks like a, 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 the, the winding of a snail's shell. Uh, called the golden rule, the golden, I think it's the golden rule. Leading lines. Leading lines are formed by elements within your image and they lead the viewer's eye into and around. This is an unusual configuration as geese usually fly in a V formation. This leaves the lead goose, goose to cut through the air, reducing the air pressure for those uh, geese that follow. It's like a the race car drivers who draft uh, behind the, the who draft behind the the lead cars uh, to save on gas. Um, Debbie, I I see there are nine comments in the chat. You know, I'm, I'm just going through those, and I I I was just typing up a thing to say. Remember. Uh, now, when I, when I first did the introduction, I told you that Chris would be, uh, he wants you to ask the questions when you um, have them on a specific slide. So I'd like those people who have responded in the chat box to go ahead and ask those questions of Chris now. Uh, Gypsy, you had, you had one. So here's one question. Um, are these taken with the S21 or the digital camera? I, I've got several that are the S21, but the most are shot with my uh, digital camera. Uh, okay. So and, if and Mike, here, Chris, this is... Yeah. This is Gypsy. Here's my question. If I, I have an iPhone 11. <clears throat> yep. And if I have it set on the you know, best telescoping lens, it has three lenses. Should I use my fingers to expand the screen or will that actually make the distant image more pixelated? I'm thinking about your birds right here where, you know, they're very far away. Um, and you're trying to zoom in. So there, so there are two kinds of zoom. As you zoom in, firstly, you're using optical zoom, and that's your best. At some point, it becomes digital, where it's kind of making it up as you go, and that will be pixelated. So you will shoot what you what you see. So as you zoom in, stop. You know, if it becomes pixelated, go back a little bit, and then you can you should be able to get that picture. So on someone mentioned their iPhone. So in on my I have no idea about iPhone, but here's what I, on my phone. If I go into in the camera and then I go to the three dots, go to into settings, then there's a thing that says grid. And I just click on that and then I've got the grid. So why don't you try that on your phone? I mean, after, after you've done it for a while, you can kind of feel, feel where, they, where the people and, and the objects are laid out on your, on your phone. Are you able to find it, Debbie? I'm, I'm trying to find it on my phone and I actually don't I, I have an iPhone also and I can't find it I don't does anybody know where you find it on your iPhone I don't see it Chris I if, found the grid in mine Debbie it's um it is in the settings under the camera and you can oh okay click that open and it will show the grid oh great um, and my question had to do with uh, trying to get a close up okay. of something so far away as these birds. So I'm, I know that there are a few settings where I have a couple of different little cameras in the iPhone, but what happens if you, you know, you use your fingers, you put them on the screen oh. and then you expand your fingers and it makes the image larger. 
Is that going to actually make the image more pixelated? I, I think it does, but I wanted to ask Chris. No, that's, you're right. So you're better off zooming in and taking the picture than taking a picture and then pinching it out. That will be get pixelated. Okay. I okay. think that was all. Thank you. Wait, can, can you repeat that? Yeah, you're better off taking the, zooming in and taking the picture then you are taking a picture and then trying to pick, pinch it open. So when you pinch it open, you've already captured the picture. And now as you pinch it open, you'll get to a point where it's pixelated. Right. Okay. Oh. All right. All right. Great. Okay, I think that they, but from now on, when you have a question, just kind of break in as he takes a breath, because this is so much information. I'm sure all of us are going to have to watch uh, his video on YouTube to uh, ingrain all the information. Chris, you're doing an excellent job. I need to just tell you that this is excellent. Thank you. So there are 265 slides in this presentation some with two and three pictures on each one. So there's, there's a lot of information. Um, in a similar matter, the first bison tramples down. So we talked about how the, the first goose breaks through the wind for the other geese. So these bison are walking in a line because the first buffalo and the second buffalo trampled down the snow so it's easier walking. First, I love this image. One of, the, one of the guys in my, my Masonic Lodge had a new baby and wanted me to take a picture. I love that you don't see the mother's eyes as she's looking at the baby. The mother's head is on the left horizontal line. The baby's nose is on the, the uh, lower right PowerPoint. Now think about how your eyes move through this image. For me, the dark part on her hair leads my eyes into the image. Can you see the arrow? No. no? Okay. Uh, leads my eye into the image. Then her nose draws me, my eye to the baby. Her hair is another leading line. My eye follows her part into the frame. Her hanging hair leads my eye down to her curl, up her hand to the baby's face. My eye starts on the green blinds at the bottom, then to the lamp near the lower left power point, then follows the lamp mount, the dark concrete on the, and then back down to the, Bene the Venetian blinds. Now, <clears throat> had I been thinking about it when I took the picture, up in the top right, there is a window reflecting some um, tile on a roof. If I'd have been smart, I would have opened the frame up more so that was on the top right PowerPoint. That would have been so much more powerful. But here it's lost. These train tracks provide perspective lines into the distance. Subsequent, so, oh, after taking this picture, I found out um, it's illegal to photograph on or near train tracks. They're private property and it's dangerous to stand on the train tracks. Here, the people, shops, and a train are added to perspective, or are added, excuse me. So they, they're providing um, perspective lines. Further, they represent um, additional lines. Um, so this, on our trip to uh, Europe, this is my sister. You can see that she had three backpacks that she was packing around. So there are lots of leading lines in this picture.
in this image, the leading lines are the, the roof of the uh, train station, those arches, the trains, the tracks, they're all heading out um, in, into infinity. Um, the bit of the story is the young man taking his bicycle down to the train. Um, in Boise Hotel, they had a little strip of grass. And so somebody built the Aspen Lofts, the condominium on that little stretch of grass. One day I was standing there and I noticed a window washer. I call this image Spider-Man. And on the right picture, let's see, where is it? I don't see it right now, but um, I had this on display in a gallery at one point, and the guy came out and said, that's my, that's my room there. You can see my lamp. Here are backlit Seattle power lines. This is the interior of the Yellowstone Old Faithful Inn. And you see how the lines are leading your eyes in both these pictures. This is the front wall shot from the inside of the Berlin train station. This is the inside of another train station and you see all the lines leading your eye. And uh, there's your McDonald's. The, so this is in between uh, two of the Cinque Terre. The lines of surf, the, the surf line, the beach umbrellas and the lounges direct your eye along the walkway to the next of the five Cinque Terre. The fun piece in this image is not well placed. Again, it should have been up in the lower right-hand quadrant, but I wasn't thinking about that when I took the picture. My guess is that this man under the red umbrella is renting the beach spaces. I see someone leaning in. Hang on a second. I'll, oops. Is that better? I see you nodding. Kate. <laughs> okay. And this is interesting too. There's only one per, well, there's some people, anyway. This is an interesting element of a full image. However, it leaves more questions than it, the, the full image leaves more questions than it answers. The image is of a windsurfer on the Columbia River. While she's near the opposite power point, she's so far away that she isn't noticed immediately. This colored line reminds you where the paraglider and her rope. I guess it's not a paraglider, it's a windsurfer, sorry. Diagonal lines create dynamism. So this is that picture from the fri from Friday Harbor. And I, an art teacher told me that diagonal lines create dy dynamism in paintings and photography. This is the ferry dock uh, before the turbulent water. These light beams were captured in the Olympic National Forest. So I retired, I was a speech language pathologist in the public schools for 35 years. And I retired in 2008. And I had planned a trip to the Pacific Northwest. And my, I didn't even have a camera. So I borrowed my mom's digital camera and I took the right-hand picture in the Olympic National Forest. And a few months later, I had the opportunity to, to blow it up. And instantly, emotionally, I was right back at that sense of awe and inspiration. And I thought, well, this is a powerful thing to do. And so I, that's what got me into to photography. The, the fairy dock picture is also from my mom's digital shoot. This barnacle image, demonstrates digital lines, repeated patterns, and filling the frame. I captured this image in September of 2021 on the Oregon coast. 
And I'm considering entering this at the, in the Western Idaho State Fair. Just, I love it. And, and behind it is a, a, have you, has any, I'm assuming, has anybody heard the term broca? Well, so photographers talk about broca and that is the top, the top triangle here. That is the background is blurred. They, they like, I think it's bokeh, and they love to have bokeh. Uh, this is an element on that Gaudi um, building. Um, it again, even though it's scalloped, it, it ha has a diagonal line to it. Uh, these images represent diagonal lines, repeated patterns, and filling the frame. Love, love, love this one. My sister, her niece, and, a, and my sister from America went, we were in Berlin. And we're waiting at a street corner and I looked down at the ground. This woman was in front of us uh, waiting for a Berlin crosswalk light. In addition to the diagonal pavement, pavement lines, I loved her backlit lace and it's shadow on the ground. And within the shadow, you can see the white material in the concrete, which doesn't show up outside of her shadow. There's just so many little Easter eggs. It's, I've got a slide later, way late in the, in the thing, but my idea of a great picture is one that every time you look at it, you see something different. Um, I, for, for just giggles, um, I'll, I'll direct you to the, the background in my Zoom picture. Do you have that in front of you? Katie, nod if you've got it. Yes. Okay. So this is between the two entrances to Adventureland in Disneyland. And everything in there is a reflection, except down at the bottom left, there's a, a, a branch. And then there's also an egret. And this egret was turning. And as I, I took pictures and his reflection is a egret, 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 penguin. So his shadow, his reflection there looks like an emperor penguin. Go ahead and pinch it bigger. I don't know if you can do that. Chris, we yeah. don't see a picture. Chris, we so, don't. So Debbie, we so on, do you have my picture? No. On the, on the Zoom? No, we're back with the lady with the lace. Right. So on the Zoom, so I've got a bunch of pictures of people. I can see Debbie and Sherry and Kate. Do you see that on your screen? No, it's still the lady with the lace. All right. At the end, I'll, I'll turn off the share so that you can see my picture. It's, it's a wonderful picture. I call it, so, so it's, a, it's a, a reflection. It's a, it's a pond. And there's an egret, and his shadow looks like an emperor penguin. And I call the picture penguin dreams, like the penguin is dreaming to be in Florida or, or California. I guess you'll have to wait to see that. I guess we'll have to. Yeah. This college student, new to balloon crewing, didn't know that balloon pilots use propane flames to heat the air in their balloon envelope. She didn't know there would be a loud noise or that flames would be rushing past her head. Her surprised, excited face tells her story. The flame and cables provide diagonal lines and this image fills the frame. You might also notice the red element in this image. The Easter egg, a close look reveals a wad of gum on her lower left molar. <laughs> Another diagonal flame gives the appearance of a fire breather. Leading lines and curves make this an interesting image. I love, love, love this. This is, this is the Antwerp station. It displays many repeated patterns. Just that all day. Um, this one, again, has an asterisk in the corner I found on the internet. 
And I just, you can follow those leading lines all day. In addition to the repeated patterns, these images also feature colors. Ooh, like that. This is your golden corral. So you can find beauty. I mean, it's all around you. This is a common architectural treatment seen in Italy, probably other places, but I, what, what I love about it is the way the light shines into, like the light shines into this first arch here, and then there's a part that's shadowed and the juxtaposition just, and then there's a leading line straight down the middle and then down the far side and then the, the capitals of these columns down the other side, there's just, you're drawn into the image. Is that fun? Does anybody else think it's fun? Mm -hmm. I'm getting nothing from you guys. I'm talking to <laughs> myself here. You're mesmerized. Well, I hope so. That's, that's, a, that's a great picture. Thank you. Now I went to the wilds of the Boise Zoo for this picture. <laughs> If you didn't guess, this is a close view of a zebra. Ooh, peacocks. So one winter day, I took my little puppy out to do its business. Oh, yeah. And I noticed this frost pattern on my van. I tried to take the picture, but all I got was my silhouette and the bright sunshine. So I got in the van, shot through the window. So this is the frost pattern on my van sliding door window. Great. Really beautiful stuff exists all around you. I've got a wonderful picture of a dead hosta plant in our garden. I'm, I'm trying to inspire you guys here. Okay. Okay, I'm going to talk looking. That's frost on a window. Yeah. Inside. Wow. Okay. So when I go outside in the winter, I'll shoot before I scrape. Oh. Wow. This is Yellowstone in winter. I highly recommend going, you guys making the trip. It's, they've got these little, uh, it's like a hundred dollars for the day and and you get on this little bus and they put these three wheel cat treads on it and they, they drive you either to Old Faithful or to uh, uh, the Grand Canyon. Um, so in this picture, repeated patterns, we've got the trees, we've got the shadows, and you'll notice the horizon is not necessarily on the rule of thirds. So in 2019, my barbershop chorus went to Salt Lake City for the international contest. We scored high enough to perform as the mic testers, but not high enough to be in the contest. So on a piece of paper, jot down. Katie, I'm watching you jot this okay. down. Boy, the Boise Chordsman the Boise song. And don't look it up right now, but um, we, we performed, so mic testers, they, they, they have you perform so that they can make sure the sound and the lighting is correct. So there's an even platform for all the contestants. So when Jewel was coming to Boise, one of her roadies said, Jewel, we're going to Boise. You gotta remember, there is no Z in Boise. And so she wrote a song about it with accompanying slides. You could look up online to see her version. She gave us permission for free to make a barbershop version of that. We performed it in Salt Lake City. You never see the videos of the mic testers because they didn't score high enough to be in the contest. We've got a lot of hits. It's, it was very popular. Whenever people saw that we were from Boise, they said, oh, we love the Boise song. So that's our little claim to fame. 
So again, this is in the, one of the Mormon, this is in the old Mormon tabernacle uh, in Salt Lake City. And here's the pipes and the, and the quartet was singing there. This picture, you'll be pleased to know, is from my cell phone. I went to the Oregon coast and this is upside down, suspended by its uh, sticky tubes from a rock in a tidal pool. Is that cool? That's cool. I mean, you never see that. No, you don't. So I'm not certain of the mechanism. I, I've tried to look it up. It's sticky. Uh, Some places it says suction. I don't know how they hold on, but again, that's from my cell phone. All right. Any guess on what that could be? Jellyfish. Put the last picture Jellyfish? fully. Don't let. No, no, no. Don't let the last picture of the ocean guide you because the, these pictures are from totally different places all right i'll give you another look at it <laughs> what is it it's a oh, beer cooler yeah i was at Bottle. the state i was at the state fair and this is an ice chest full of of ice and water cooling off the bottles and the cans but I thought, God, those bottoms of the bottles look really cool. Unobserved beauty surrounds us, man. Wow. My goodness. Isn't that fun? Mm -hmm. That is different. So this is, this is in Venice, actually. They've got the same ceiling treatment. Um, and you can see all the lines coming down to the center. And not just the 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 uh, the piping at the top, but like the capitals of the columns make another leading line. And I love I love the way the light comes around the columns because it, it it goes from shadow to light. It's just kind of graded. If you haven't guessed, I'm into this. This picture on the right. Is bittersweet for me. I was at the Getty Museum and I was on the second floor. I was coming out of uh, an exhibit on Mayan gold or something. And I looked down and this is the outdoor dining area at the Getty Museum. I had my cell phone camera with me, but not a DSLR. I took this picture, but it's so pixelated, I can't blow it up any bigger. Hmm. So this picture, uh, hang on, yes. So as you look at this picture, the tables are made of slats of wood. Let me back it up because that's a, a better picture. Elise, you can take a picture of that if you want. You're muted, Elise. I was checking the grid. Oh, did you get it to work? Yeah. Cool. Cool. So the, the square and circular tables, they're made of slats. But the beauty of this is if you look at the concrete below, so you've got this gray background, and then you've got the shadows where the, where the light and the dark of the, you see why I didn't want people to watch this on a phone? The bigger the, the, bigger the screen, the better you're going to get out of this. And so you've got the chairs that are, look like shadows. And then you've got the circles and the squares and the black and white lines. It's just everywhere you look, there's something cool in it. Does anybody else like that picture? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Thank you. I think the surprise is that there's light coming through the tabletops. Yeah, well, there's slats. They're just slats of wood. Right, yeah, they look solid though when the oh, picture. Yeah, they do, they do. This was a street, okay. Some of your li leading lines will be physical, like the street crossing lines. Others will be artifacts of light. These shadows are created by the windows between the columns. Mm -hmm. 
It's unusual to see people naturally present a repeated pattern. This testifies to a shared emotional response of these two roller derby girls. Is that a great picture? My God. Um, an individual subject can provide repeated patterns along with interesting details. Hard on his repeated patterns. So every every year there's a I guess it's a fundraiser for for charity, but they have a beard contest and people come in from all over and compete for the best beard, the best uh, short, you know, different categories. Uh, when I was at the coast with my brother and his wife, excuse me, <laughs> that's crazy. When I was at the coast with my sister and her husband in uh, September, I caught this picture. So every day when the sun set, everyone ran down to this. This was at, uh, oh, can't remember the name of the park. It's in Oregon, it's the, the furthest South Harris Beach um, State Park. So I was standing there and the sun was so stinking bright. So I positioned myself so that the tree was in front of the sun. And then I noticed that the shadows surrounding the tree filled the frame, but also made kind of a heart shape. There was a man sitting on the bench and he was looking down not because he was sad or anything, but because the sun was so darn bright, or the sun was so bright. Now I timed when I took the picture. There are people walking along the path between me and the tree. One of them is behind the tree and like three of them are behind the bush. So this part is, is about framing your image. So here we've used the shadow of the tree and vegetation to frame this image. The next one, my sister's in Cotor Montenegro walking underneath a uh, um, in, in the walled city. Here, I was taking pictures and I can't remember where I was, but I used part of the, the frame of that window to frame the image. This is at the uh, train depot up on the second level. This was in Mexico. And so we were in this building and the, the window frame framed a portion of the image. This is in uh, a museum ceiling in uh, Helsinki. And this one probably belongs in another section of the presentation, your eyes drawn to the white, but um, it's here. This is at the College of Idaho. This is their chapel. And you see at the top, there are two leading lines going towards it. At the bottom, there are leading lines towards it. And then there are columns and aluminum in the windows. Love this one. This is your Idaho State Penitentiary. <laughs> Can't just you can't just drive a truck in there you know it's got to go into a holding area so they can make sure there's nobody under it or or leaving by it so this is the holding area and so this is a, i had a kid stand still and i took this picture and it's framed by his glasses frames leading lines fills the frame just it's just a little easter egg this is at the uh balloon festival and uh, I wasn't fast enough to get a nice crisp picture, but it's a fun picture. All right, who recognizes this? You see it every stinking day. It's on the hotel that Oh, it's in the Grove. Yep, this is the river graphic on the side of the Grove Hotel. Now, yeah. I don't know for sure, but I think those bubbles are supposed to represent the hot air balloons. Because when they have the hot air 
the balloon festival, they'll go along and they try and touch down just to just to smack the water. That's a, one of the things that they like to do. Um, and in the in the summer, they have a little bit of mist that comes off of the graphic. And so if you if you saw this picture up close, the colors at the top of the of the image are are rising above the image because they're lighting the, the mist. All right, the human eye likes an S curve. You should, okay, you recognize the river graphic. A well-known tip landscape photography is that once you've captured that beautiful landscape photograph, look behind you, you'll find something of equal beauty. After photographing the Colosseum, I turned around to discover, oops, ah. Okay, I'm back in control. After photographing the Colosseum, I turned around to discover a black storage unit covered with colorful graffiti from people around the world. Is that fun? Yes. <laughs> and I bet I'm probably the only person who took a picture of that. Photographing people. Allow your subjects to relax and be themselves. Ask for connection and their relationships will shine through. The triangle of faces is also a pleasing arrangement. You want to see their connection, contact arms, heads, uh, in addition to demonstrating their close relationship, it usually generates natural smiles and silliness. Group your subjects so that they fill the frame and the background doesn't peek through. See how this distracting piece of background catches your eye. In addition to removing distracting element, elements, this keeps your camera from focusing on the background instead of your intended subjects. While the connected heads are very nice, the hands and arms add to the connection. Can you see that? Oh. I mean, actually, can you feel the difference? He who shall not be named. <laughs> As I was wandering around taking photos at the 2019 Spirit of Boise Balloon Challenge, I found these four BSU roommates on a blanket watching the balloons. This is a great illustration of connection and relationship. While I love that the young ladies filled the majority of the frame, I couldn't eliminate the background grass without cropping, without uh, losing part of the top woman's head. This is the second time that I photographed these BSU roommates at the balloon challenge. Here in 2017, and they say, oh, there's our photographer. <laughs> in addition to the natural connection in this image, I love the disconnected Easter egg at the lower right. Mm -hmm. So rules are made to be broken. Here are, the three, here are three generations. Apart from the child's hands, they look unconnected. They could be three people in line at a bank. There are also several background distractions. Do you see the difference between this and the other pictures? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Given a prop, your subjects huh. can surprise you. <laughs> This Halloween dog witch on Harrison Boulevard, while looking out of frame, is well posed against the pop of red. Mm -hmm. I'm always pleasantly surprised when posed women raised a finger to their lip with either a painted or a tattooed mustache. <laughs> I was taking pictures at the roller derby and, and the girls were, the ladies were all standing there and 
And they looked at each other and then they all put up a finger and they had my mustache on their fingers, tattooed. <laughs> partial face. Sometimes it's interesting to see a partial face. As you pose yourself, you be aware of potential background issues. You don't want a background element. Oh, sorry. So that's great costume. Yeah. As you pose your subject, be aware of potential background issues, background and foreground. You don't want a background element that cuts through your subject. You see how that is? Yeah. I was watching one of the presidential speeches recently, and there's a bookshelf, there's a fire across his neck. Show closeness and relationship. People tend to pose a bit stiff with their heads upright, upright. When their heads are tipped a bit towards their fellow subject, even to the point of touching heads, the image is more powerful. Can you feel the difference? Yeah. The first image was the natural pose for this group of runners. I then asked for more connection. Then I asked that they put their heads together. This gave some symmetry and allowed for a closer, more, de more detailed image. And I can feel the difference. Stack of heads. You will love this. With subjects of varying heights, especially children, this pose gets the subject's heads together for a closer, more fun image. And it usually generates a little bit of laughter and silliness. This diagonal pose gathers the heads of several people of varying heights. This is a bar mitzvah that I photographed. Love these ladies. Despite their height difference, all three poses get their heads closer together. In the first image, I requested that they show connection and contact. For the second, that they put their heads together. The third image is a family group from the larger group image. By this point, they understood the pose uh, to show connection, put their heads together. Invariably, when I say touch heads, a child will reach out to touch someone's head. <laughs> Here are three more examples of connection and heads together. Requesting heads together often inspires silliness in your subjects. The next image illustrates hand connections. While it doesn't demonstrate heads together, the boy's look of delight at hot air balloons is precious. As their photographer, you help them to capture priceless moments of joy. Love it, love it, love it. Posing people, requesting closeness and contact generally adds an element of fun and generates engagement. Big difference, huh? Mm -hmm. I love that one. And when I asked them to put their heads together, they put a gherkin between them. And <laughs> <laughs> this was at the deli days. Santa and Mrs. Claus, okay, don't be too quick to put your camera down. Something cool might just happen. Many subjects bring their own creativity to your image. Remember the girl with the candy cane. Hair hanging between subjects separates them in your image. It reduces their closeness and isolates them one from another. All you have to do is request that the long hair on the adjacent subject side be moved behind the shoulder. I mean, this could have been such an intimate picture, but she's blocking him with her hair. 
my favorite couples pose. Subjects have referred to this as the prom pose. It contains head contact, visible hand connections, no space between subjects. The icing on the cake on the pose is her hand on his heart, him holding her hand lovely, lovingly with her wedding band in clear view. Now the next one, note how much more powerful these images are when both subjects are tipping their heads towards the partner. The, in the last one, their heads are straight up and it just doesn't sell. Worse yet, if their heads are leaning away from the other person, it really tells a different story. Lighting. When your light source is behind your subject, backlit, their face can be left in shadow. To light the subject, simply turn on your flash. This is simply, this is known as fill flash. However, it can be artistic to leave your subject backlit in the dark with a flash. What? As I was leaving, hmm? comment. <laughs> As I, as I was leaving the Western Idaho State Fair, I noticed the back side of this dress booth. This is a backlit Seattle, Seattle construction site, a fire eater. I especially like the backlighting of her hanging hair. With a cell phone, you won't have control over how much is in focus. This is called depth of field. So when I take wedding pictures, I love to take the, the wedding ring on the Bible. So you, you set the Bible up, you um, hold the position of the pages in place. I've, I've got a couple of little clamps. And you set a flashlight above the top of the Bible on a small tripod. The curvature of the pages come, the, the pages curve, uh, curvature produces the heart shaped shadow of the ring. Um, and I was saying before, you don't have control over depth of field. Depth of field, if you look, you can see that. The place that's in focus, you can read the print, but beyond that and before that, it's out of focus. You can capture both rings on the Bible. The light will create intertwined sh heart shadows. This is done, uh, I told you how it's done. And in the last picture, you see the, the um, heart-shaped lit area so the dark, produ the dark produces a, a heart within that, and that's produced by the height and the angle of the, um, the flashlight. Does anybody like those pictures? Mm -hmm. That's different. Yeah, I, it's a lot, I've, I've, I discovered, the only problem with this one is, like in the first picture, I can't get the woman's ring to stand up right with the stone on top. I do that. Side lighting. So we talked about backlighting. Here's side lighting. Be careful of nose shadows. So if you're cruel on a harsh day like I was, you have them turn their face to face the, the light source, and that removes the shadow. It's more kind to use your fill flash. You use the flash on your camera, and that'll wash away the shadow. Same is true of top lighting. With top lighting, their eyebrows create shadows on their face. But if you have them look towards the top of your head, then they get more of the top lighting on their faces and they're better lit. Or you can use um, fill flash. All right, Katie, are you paying attention? I am. You need to look at these next few pictures. The trick to, re no, okay. First, I have to say, it's not that you've got a double chin, but I noticed you weren't watching. And this is a fun one. The trick to reducing a double chin is to have the subject extend their chin toward the camera, not up, down, just toward the bottom of the camera. So here's a closer view. The next image was her default pose to discourage more photos. <laughs> Interestingly, she 
just the opposite, pulling in her chin and emphasizing her double chin. So now the first two photos are her before and after. So later in the day, I took this picture of her with her family. Um, she liked the chin forward tip so much that even in the excitement of this, she used the technique even in her Star Wars picture. Looking into the image, your image, your subject should face into the frame and leave room for movement into, not out of the image. The cyclist is carrying his bike into the image. This pinup girl at the Warhawk Air Museum is looking up at the World War II plane. Her sunglasses reflect her yellow parasol. Here, the harpist is looking into the frame at her hands and harp strings. This, this perspective includes better view of her colorful strings and tension units. We are also able to see the details of her wrist, uh, lace, her wrist lace and gloves, lace scarf and velvet jacket. Her hands, strings, tension units and eyes um, are on power lines and power points. While, she, while this woman, is looking in the frame, this image is less powerful as you can't see what she's looking at. Here they're walking into the frame. This is, these are belly dancers at the um, Goathead Festival. And I like that the, the picture is basically a gray picture. And you've got this great pieces of colored cloth sweeping through and they're blue and orange. So they're opposite on the color wheel. <laughs> So I told you about going to Las Vegas, or excuse me, going to uh, Salt Lake City for the contest. Well, in 2017, the barbershop contest was in um, Las Vegas. And I was taking pictures for the digital uh, newsletter. And I was taking pictures of red, and, red, white, and blue because the contest is always over 4th of July. Well, this cup, this lady was getting prepared and she invited, she was getting prepared for her wedding, so she invited me. So they were both in the barbershop world and they both lost their partners. And over time they had gotten together and so they wanted to get married. You may recognize the unknown minister. <laughs> Elvis. So Bruges, Belgium is a 13th century um, city. So I was taking pictures and this jogger, these three joggers come along and I wasn't able to catch her hair in the shadow. That would have made this a great picture, but it's still a pretty darn good one. You can see her shadow on the cobblestones. You can see her hair flying in the air. She's frozen in space. This guy, his shadow looks like he's carrying a briefcase, but if you look up, it's just a shopping bag. Animals need to have room to move within the image and should be looking into the image. So this, the water in the elephant's trunk form an S-curve. While the rabbi has room to move into the image, he's looking out of the image. This draws the viewer's eye out of the image so that they don't see the details of the baby or his prayer shawl, which is called the talus. This Amsterdam, this Amsterdam cyclist has a little room to write into the image. The fun element is that he's looking at his cell phone as he rides. This pregnant woman wearing a minion costume, Google on a, a goggle on her belly, is walking out of the image. Consider the brightest element. You remember that picture of the museum ceiling with that bright circle? It should have been in this section because your eye goes right to the, the brightest spot and you miss the detail in the rest of the picture. Like you look at the music, sheet music, and not on drummer. So this is, we're back at the balloon festival, photographing babies and pets. The family brought, this family brought blueberry pancakes to the Spirit of Boise Challenge. <laughs> Keeping the puppy warm. Oh. A family wrapped in blankets. What you need to do is instruct 
all sentient beings to hold their pose and wait for the baby or the pet to look at the camera. In time, the dog will, the dog will look at the camera. <laughs> I have many images of a smiling baby or a dog looking at the camera with someone else looking at the baby or the pet. The little boy's looking at the camera while grandpa is looking at him. The dog's looking as he should, but the master isn't. The cherub is looking and smiling at the camera while the mother isn't looking at the camera, while the mother isn't looking at the camera. However, this image is compelling as it shows mother love and the delight of the child. It also shows an inferred leading line. Here, the child least likely to look at the camera is the only one who did. <laughs> so the head distance from the camera. By positioning subjects in the same plane, their heads will be the same size. In the first image, the woman, so I took this picture and the woman on the right said, my head's too big. You made my head too big. So I took another one. By positioning subjects in the same plane, in the, in the first image, the woman on the right was forward and it made her head look larger than, than her mates. <laughs> Further, by being in the same plane, there's a better chance that they will all be in focus. Now I've told you all of that so that I could tell you this. You've heard that a picture is worth a thousand words? Tell a story. The stories can be, can be big or small. As you hold the camera, you record the stories that you see. The image can spark a viewer's imagined backstory. So we're gonna go into storyland here. So, so this is Holy. Celebrated in Boise. This is a before and after shot. Look at that lovely family. <laughs> Now this gal, oh. wow! This is in one of the Cinque Terre. This elderly Italian woman is preparing her shopping bag for the long climb up to her home. This is a climb she has made every day since she was a little girl. The viewer's eye starts at the repeated pattern of the old worn steps. They draw the viewer's eye to the old woman on the lower right PowerPoint. The eye, the viewer's eye is then led along the curve around the gray portion of the salmon colored building, then finally to the right and down the bars and back to the woman. This elephant in the Berlin Zoo created two holes in the ground. One had water in it. She took some water and dumped it into the second hole, stirred it to create mud, then she sprayed it on her back. In 2015, I went to Italy with one of my sisters at the Colosseum. I photographed an actor dressed as a centurion. I later discovered that they asked 35 euro for a photo. This might explain the stink face. Later, I saw a cool helmet on a concrete pole. Uh, so this is one of those ballards that keeps you from running into the Colosseum. I thought that these three points drew the viewer's eye away from the reflection. So I got closer to draw the viewer's eye to the Colosseum reflected on the Centurion's helmet. Very cool. As, thank you very much. As soon as I captured this image, the stink-faced soldier collected his helmet saying, excuse me. <laughs> so I, I love this image. But when you think about it, this is something that Christ could have seen. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of sobering. In 2018, I photographed some of the obstacles at the local Spartan Run. Every year, this extreme obstacle course event is staged in multiple locations around the globe. The event presents a grueling day of running, 
climbing and carrying. Near the end of the race, the uh, participants had to jump into a series of three water-filled trenches. And then on climbing out, the, the exit wall is covered in visqueen, so it's slippery and they had to help each other. Um, so here's someone jumping in, you can see a shadow beneath him. And here's someone helping another guy out. The final stage of this run was a trench filled with burning wood. Most runners jumped over the fire. One man emerged from the water, looked at the fire, put his hand, put on his gloves and walked across the burning wood on his hands because he had no legs. Recall that he just completed an obstacle course in which it was hard for runners who had all their limbs. Gelato in Helsinki Park. The silver covers set over various gelato flavors. As there's a, a woman in a dress standing in front of the glass, we're able to see the gelato sign. The server is filling a gelato cup and the shadow of the gelato sign is on her arm and her arm is reflected on the gelato covers. An Italian legging store and leg-shaped door handles. <laughs> Three views of an iconic Helsinki church. I love this reflection of the church, especially the circular ripple in the lower left. This young man's painting of the church. Note his worn brush, the worn board, and the worn board supporting his painting. Image, images from the Bris, the Jewish circumcision. This takes place on his eighth day after he was born. Here's a street performer in Helsinki and failed beat performer. <laughs> at, the, at a Helsinki flea market, I told this man that I'd call his photo still rocking. He loved it. <laughs> You like the name. Oh my God, this image was shot from our Amsterdam canal boat tour. One can only guess the backstory. Isn't that powerful? Yes. We saw this recycling boat on our Amsterdam canal tour. So there's this in her in her the, on the far left. There's a snicker wrapper in her bath on the top of her basket. And she's dumping out a plastic bottle. It's being, oh, excuse me. So the boat is being used to remove trash from the canals. While I don't read Dutch, I think that the boat was built using recycled plastic. Thus, this boat is gemacht van Amsterdam's grassen plastic. This Amsterdam cafe has a padded Eve equipped with pillows and blankets. <laughs> Here the server is passing the coffee through the window. Outside the 13th century French walled city, this bocce ball player, pardon me, is holding his balls as he awaits <laughs> his turn. On the French Riviera, this man is mending his nets. This was a great fashion statement, which we saw several times in Amsterdam. The woman would be re in regular street clothes, wearing a colorful silk dressing gown. This museum poster watched us on our Amsterdam canal tour. <laughs> These tourists are resting on a staircase in the 13th century French walled village. Here's an Italian woman riding her bike in, uh, oops, in high heels. While waiting for a ferry to Sweden, this street performer allowed the little boy to hold supporting his spinning dish. This waitress just crossed the road balancing an open table umbrella. This little Italian dog was hit by a sneak wave and is shaking it off. While awaiting our Berlin Canal boat tour, I watched this street performer uh, she was creating huge bubbles on the bridge to the amazement of this toddler. 
I love that this little girl's eyes are echoed by those stitched on her hat. This young lady is sitting on the stairs in her home on the Italian coast. The scene could have been from the past. However, she's playing on her tablet. These bison are feeding on vegetation in a geothermal stream. One has wisely opted to take a hot tub break. <laughs> there's, a, there's an Italian street bubble maker. In color, in color, the flames dominated this image. Using black and white, we can see more detail. I removed the distraction of color to reveal the details. Here, my niece is texting from one of the memorial stones. Be ready and anticipate. Remember, remember, subjects repeat poses. Animal, uh, sorry, animals, children, and even adults repeat poses and body positions. If you saw a cool pose, keep your camera on them, and when it repeats, when it repeats, you can capture it. This costume actor in Barcelona is portraying Christopher Columbus, the Christopher Columbus st statue in the harbor. And his, his makeup is amazing. The statue is supposed to be pointing to the new world. The joke is that when the city placed the statue, it isn't pointing west. <laughs> As elsewhere in the world, the actor expects payment for posing with tourists. Modern cell phone cameras have many cool options, including panorama, slow motion, mm -hmm. super That's slow motion, hyperlapse, pro mode, most of these options are unavailable to DSLR users. Modern cell phone cameras can also take long exposure and bursts of images. Long exposure. Uh, these long exposure images will require a tripod. Those images with an asterisk are from the internet. When the shutter stays open for several seconds to minutes, you capture a long exposure. While the shutter is open, any movement is recorded in your image. Long exposures are more tricky. They require a tripod to keep the cell phone steady so it records the movement of the subject and not your cell phone. During the long, this long, excuse me, during the long exposure, as your phone camera is on a tripod, the foreground rocks look crisp and well-focused. The falling water follows a consistent path, so it forms recognizable columns. The spray, however, is random, resulting in the milky blur. Light trails. Any moving light will be recorded by your cell phone camera sensor. These are tail lights on the freeway. While not my image, this and the next two are very cool. Huh. Fireworks. The trick with fireworks images is to set your frame where the fireworks frequently explode. Remember, these require a tripod. Uh, fireworks with a long exposure, you can capture the movement of the sparks. When possible, include a foreground element to demonstrate size. You can look into the spark detail. You can capture some crazy spark action. Below the fireworks, you can see the light trail of a passing vehicle. This image was created by stitching together five to six images in post-processing. However, it could be created using your cell phone camera panorama mode. Removing the distraction of color, you can observe more detail in this image. While it was made black and white in post, this could be achieved in one of your cell phone modes. This long exposure from my camera was captured at Hawk Stadium. To get an approximate focus for the upcoming fireworks, I focus on the stadium lights in 2017, I made a serendipitous capture. I captured the movement of the well-lit buses around the stadium lights. Wow. For lightning, find a dry place from which to set your tripod. Excuse me. 
of a dry place to shoot. Set your tripod facing the space where the lightning is repeating. Take 10 second exposures. I call this fishing for light. Your open shutter is photographing only black sky. However, if the lightning strikes during your 10 second exposure, you've captured a lightning strike. For this image, the photographer left his shutter open long enough to capture multiple lightning strikes across time. They didn't all strike at once. Star trails. For centuries, sailors have used the North Star for navigation. It's the only star which doesn't appear to move as it is geosynchronous over the North Pole. A series of 30 second exposures through the night on a tripod reveals the Earth movement with star trails. I want you to notice two things, the colors of the different stars and the great focus on the rock formation in the foreground. Now, there is a, there's free software on, for star stacking. It's called star, S-T-A-R-S-T-A-X, star stacks, one word, capital star, capital stacks. You upload your series of photos to this software and the software will combine them to create your star trail image. The next few images, while dangerous to capture, are just plain fun to view. The key element is the shower of sparks. Wow. And this is in sepia tone. And then you add a fire eater. Just for giggles, here are the secrets behind spark trails. Put steel, with, put steel wool in a whisk basket, suspend it from a chain or a cable so it won't burn through, light it on fire and swing it over your head. Obviously there are safety considerations including keeping a fire extinguisher. <laughs> These considerations are detailed in the following video. Image burst. This is when you take a series of photos by holding down the shutter button. Oops, sorry. So on my cell phone, I recently discovered, so the pictures I'm, I'm getting to uh, were captured with my DSLR in continuous mode. <clears throat> but I found out that if I put my finger on my shutter button and pull it down, it will take a series, it will take a burst of images. Okay, this is when you take a series of photos by holding your camera, uh, your uh, shutter button down. Louis Pasteur was once told, Louis, you have been very lucky to have made so many scientific discoveries. Well, Louis Pasteur said, fortune favors the prepared mind. As a photographer, you can be, you can also be lucky, just be prepared. For example, in 2018, I attended the Meridian Lions uh, rodeo, Lions Club Rodeo on Cherry Lane near McDermott. Uh, the rodeo photographer was in the air arena right in front of my bleacher section. I noticed that a small bull had not been collected following his event. The bull was about 20 feet from the photographer. This is a very unusual sight, so I thought I'd capture the image. As soon as I raised my camera, the bull attacked the photographer. Uh -huh. the first the first impact broke his expensive $2,000 lens in half. The entire attack took place before the broken lens part settled on the ground. By chance, uh, sorry, by chance my DSLR was in continuous mode or I wouldn't have captured this remarkable series. See the lens over there still? Around the arena, there were small black flags advertising Coke Zero. On the back, they said, enjoy every moment. <laughs> wow. In the last image, the photographer is walking away with his, with his broken lens and bruised pride, but not injured. Now that you know what to look for, you'll begin to see naturally occurring compositions everywhere. Adapt these techniques to capture the world you see and tell your stories. These, are the, these, were, are, these concepts were discussed in this presentation. You may want to use your cell phone camera to photograph this slide as a reminder of the compositions te techniques we've discussed. 
NKA will archive a recording of this presentation so you can review it should you wish. My fault. Got to get your pictures. Chris, you have yeah. done an extraordinary uh, presentation. I just can't believe all the stuff I learned today and all the stuff I'm going to do uh, after I rewatch the presentation, of course. Yeah. Thank you. We're not, so we've, got, we've, got three, we've got three more slides. Okay. Huh? I've mentioned this before, a great image is one that every time you look at it, you find something new. Now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for attending my presentation. It was fun putting together. You know, the interesting thing was when Sheena asked me to do it, I usually look at my pictures as here's the state fair, here's the balloon festival, here's Italy, here's Europe. But this is the first time I looked at pictures these have a similar technique. These are a similar technique. It was very interesting. Oh, and such a wonderful way of presenting it. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, all of your attendance. Now there are some classes coming up that you can still register for. So make sure one, that- One more, De yep. Debbie. So, um, now you can see that picture behind me with the egret with the shadow of a penguin. Right. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's all yours, Debbie. Okay. <laughs> the classes that are coming up are the homemade pasta, which is on the 24th, the music circle. So if you have any musical inclinations, uh, that might be one that you'd want to do. The Tai Chi, which is this is the second year of the Tai Chi. And there's a, a Zoom presentation, which I kind of think maybe you don't need to know how to use Zoom since you've been using it. Um, I just cannot tell you uh, how, how very pleased I am uh, with your presentation, Chris. Absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you. I hope it didn't go by too fast. There weren't many questions, so I didn't know if I... What, the reason there weren't any questions is because you did such an extraordinary job. I got to you, you did an extraordinary job. And so I kept thinking, this is one time where not having questions is really good because you just, you explained everything and it was new information for me, a lot of it. Well, I hope it, I, hope, I hope it helps everyone in their photography. You should be, when, I, when I've shown my pictures to people before, they come back to me and say, I'm seeing things I've never seen before, Chris. And so I'm excited for you guys. That's exactly right. Thank you all for attending. And sign up for more classes if you haven't already done so. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.